If you believe that there is just one force acting, creating, guiding in creation, then at the depths of your being, however legitimate may be your sense of grief at some of the misfortunes of the world, and of course the Prophet wasallam, as he said in that hadith when his son died, was, was sad, it doesn't make us into to robots, that we have no emotion. But the, at the depths of our being, there has to be stillness. There has to be a sense of serene acceptance and knowledge that everything is all right, that history is in good hands. And this virtue of, of Rida is focused on particularly by some of our great devotional poets. Um, one of my fa favorite poems is by Imam al-Haddad, uh, the great South Yemeni poet, died about 250 years ago, uh, who wrote a poem that goes, Ala ya sahu ya sah, la tajza' wa tajjar, wa sallim lil maqadir kay tuhmad wa tujar. Oh my friend, oh my friend, don't panic, don't be aggrieved, and submit, sallim lil maqadir, just submit to Allah's decrees, so that you can be... Uh, praiseworthy and, and rewarded. Ala ya sahu ya sah, la tajza' wa tajjar, wa sallim lil maqadir kay tuhmad wa tujar, wa kur radi bima qaddar al mawla wa dabbar, wa la tasqat qadda Allah, rabb al arsh al akbar. Wa kun radi, have rida, be accepting, uh, be pleased with what um, the Lord has arranged and distributed and decreed. And do not be angry at Allah's decree because he is the uh, Lord of the great throne. If you're angry with the way Allah has arranged things, then you don't have this great state of, of rida. Now, uh, another of my favorite poems is by uh, a more recent uh, writer, uh, Sheikh Ali bin Muhammad bin Hussein al-Habshi, uh, rahmatullahi alayhi, who was writing about a hundred years ago, I suppose, uh, another Yemeni. Uh, and he has a fairly long qasida that begins, Ya nafsu illam tazfari la tajza'i wa ila mawaidi judi mawla kihra'i wa la in ta'akhara matlabun fala rubbama fi thalika ta'akhiri kullun matma'i. And I've actually put together an English translation here and I'll read some of it because it is, I think... Um, Absolutely correct. It hits the nail on the head. And somehow, as the, the poems of all of the, the great ones do, it, it not only instructs, but somehow it breathes the principle that it's, it's trying to convey. Should you not gain your wants, my soul, then be not grieved, but hasten to that banquet which your Lord's bequeathed. And when a thing for which you ask is slow to come, then know that often through delay a gift's received. Find solace in privation and respect its due. For only by contentment is the heart relieved. And know that when the trials of life have rendered you despairing of all hope and of all joy bereaved, then shake yourself and rouse yourself from heedlessness and make pure hope a meadow that you never leave. Your maker's gifts take subtle and uncounted forms. How fine the fabric of the world his hands have weaved. The journey done, they came to the water of life and all the caravan drank deep, their thirst alleviated. My Lord, my trust in all your purposes is strong. That trust is now my shield. I'm safe and undeceived. All those who hope for grace from you will feel your reign. Too generous are you to leave my branch unleaved. May blessings rest upon the loved one, Muhammad, who's been my means to high degree since I believed. He is my fortress and my handhold, so my soul hold fast and travel to a joy still unconceived. And that, I think, sums it up, that we need to be saddened legitimately as the Anbiya alayhi wasalam were saddened when we see the misfortunes of the shadows of the world interacting and human incomprehension at their meaning. But at the same time and at a much more deeper level, the level of Tawheed which would be the bedrock of our personalities, we need to be absolutely in a state of rida. And this is actually a concept that's written into the name of the religion itself. It's one of the meanings of the word Islam. It means to surrender, to submit, to be in a state of ease with how things are. Uh, 
of course, it has the other meaning as well. Al Muslim man salim al Muslimuna min yadihi wa lisani. The Muslim is the one from whose hand and tongue other Muslims are safe. So he's Muslim, he conveys safety to his brethren. But also, the Muslim is the one who is in a state of uh, taslim, of handing over everything to Allah and knowing that things will work out in a just and appropriate and, 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 and proper way. Now, when we have this perspective, we can look around us with a different perspective entirely. And we can start to see not just the misfortunes, but also the expressions of Allah's extraordinary and continued generosity and grace and guidance to the Ummah. Sometimes, because of our sense of, of jaza or panic or nervousness about our situation, we tend to be blinded to the extraordinary blessings that continue to come from, from the Divine Presence into our lives and into the life of the Ummah. Um, and the virtue of, of, of shukr sometimes seems to be a little bit eclipsed. But if we just take a few minutes to think about the state of the present day Ummah and to stand back a little bit from the current panicky debate about this regime and that regime and so and so being oppressed and, and really worrying as the secular mind would be worried about a secular political process rather than looking at everything with optimism, with hosna zan billah, with having a good opinion of Allah's purposes, then we can start to feel the scales dropping from our eyes and we can see that actually despite our perception and the perception of other communities, the Ummah is actually fundamentally in very good shape. What I mean is, is this, that we alone have access to the wellspring of revelation. Other Ummahs no longer have. New Testament scholarship means that it's anybody's guess on their arguments as to what Sayyidina Isa actually taught or considered himself to be. The life of the Buddha, well, who knows, shrouded in mystery and, and myth. But when you come to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see the spotlights of history and we can actually tell. And by reading the seerah, you get a sense of the absolute authenticity and the human reality, particularly the period in Medina. Uh, if you read the seerah regularly, you almost feel that you're a, a character in that, in that play. It, it, it is so believable and so true and the interaction of the miraculous and the human and the Sahaba were often extraordinarily human, ordinary human beings uh, is something that can transport us back 1400 years and to give us a genuine window into the moment of goodness and wisdom and forgiveness that was the opening story of our community. No other Ummah has that. So however decadent individuals and communities might be, at least we know the road back. Nobody else knows the road back. And that's an extraordinary gift that we have, and it should make us feel, alhamdulillah, that we are still the center of Allah's providence in, in this age. Another thing that it might be worth bearing in mind is that we still have amongst us guides who can lead us back. Uh, just opening the Qur'an and the Hadith and trying to figure out what to do uh, under our own steam often gets us lost somewhere along the way and certainly it doesn't lead to unity because what happens is that the Qur'an and the Hadith are read according to the perceptions, the preferences, the insecurities of every individual reader which nobody can screen out. But what we do have in Islam which no other Ummah continues to have is ulama who stretch in a continuous chain from our generation back to the blessed foundation of the religion. So that I can go to a sheikh in Mauritania or Cairo or Yemen or wherever, and I can take his hand when I study a discipline, and I know that his hand has held a hand that held a hand that held a hand that held the hand of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in no other ummah is that chain intact. And that's an extraordinary thing, which means that not only do we have the texts that are the blueprint for a humane, decent life, but we also have people who can help us to read those texts, which is just as important. So that's another thing to rejoice about, that we still have those precious ulama with their ijazas who, and the, the madhahib system 
uh, without which religion is just a kind of DIY exercise, do-it-yourself Islam, and um, the result will be thousands of different madhahib. So that's an extraordinary blessing that we still have and we have to, we have to defend as one of our most precious legacies from the past. Another thing is the simple brute fact of the extraordinary overflowing of Iman throughout the Muslim world. That however hopeless the structures, the political or economic uh, or social structures may be, nonetheless, just about everybody still believes. And it, it, in many cases all that's required is for them to be given a key and a way and a guide and they can get back onto the path. The number of people who are profoundly existentially corrupted in the Muslim world is, is relatively small compared to other ummahs, despite the superficial catastrophe. And sometimes one can think that the West is form without content, and the Muslim world is content without form. And that can sometimes be the basis of our sense of agitation and worry about our situation. But it's much better to have content without form than form without content, because the content can produce the legitimate form. The form can't on its, by itself generate a content. So that also is good news, that we have hundreds of millions of believers, and often very strong, very pure, very dedicated believers. And that gift of Iman, because it's a gift, is sure irrefutable proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still looking with favor on our ummah, because this Iman is not self-generated, it's not something we give to ourselves, it's his gift, and it's always a sign of his favor. Another source of optimism and of contentment, satisfaction with the divine decree in our age might be the fact of the proliferation of the Ummah. Now we all know that well, there's a hadith in Abu Dawud that says towards the end of time Bal antum kathir, you will be many, lakinakum ghutha is sale, but you will be like the scum on a flash flood. In other words, there's a lot, but it has no substance, no ability to resist. But it's also the case that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes pride in our numbers. فَإِنِّي مُبَاهِنْ بِكَثْرَتِكُمُ الْأُمَّمَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Marry and multiply because I shall boast before the other ummas of your numbers on the, on the yawm al-qiyamah. This is part of Allah's sign of his, of his uh, unique status as bearer of a message. Uh, that he will have more followers than the other ummas because he is Khatam al Anbiya. Uh, and he will intercede for more than, than will be interceded for by any other prophet. And numbers do carry with them strength, however you look at it. And one of the extraordinary transformations that's taken place in the ummah over the past hundred years or so is the growth in its size through conversion to some extent, but also through natural increase. Uh, is one of the ironies and paradoxes of secular or non-Muslim elites that on the one hand they want to keep Muslim communities typically economically depressed as in many parts of the Balkans, as in India, as in China, other places. They really don't want Muslims to be in positions of power. But when you do that, you also put them in a position of poverty which in most cases will lead them to have larger families. So in India, the Muslims have bigger families than the Hindus, on average. In Bulgaria, the Muslims are now 11% of the population. It's calculated that within 30 years, they will be the majority of the population, because Bulgaria has the world's second highest abortion rate and the women aren't reproducing. Whereas the, the Muslims there all have families of six or seven kids. And this phenomenon means that 100 years ago, Muslims accounted for about 12% of the world's population. Now we are reckoned to be about 20%, which is an extraordinary growth in, in absolute terms. And the growth continues so that it's estimated that within about 25 or 30 years, we'll be 30% of the world's population, at which point we will be outstripping Christianity as the world's principal religion. And already in some places you find that Islam is the kind of default setting for religion, that because Islam... There's more to it than other religions. There's more civilization, there's more belief, there's certainly more practice um, than in any other religion. It's a big religion in that sense. That uh, Islam is being regarded as the kind of normative religion. Even in countries that are traditionally, historically Christian, 
I often find that I'm invited by companies in Britain to talk about religion in the modern world because they assume that Islam is more important in the modern world than Christianity.